just hit record. It'll be fine. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode two of This and That with me and you. Yay! So, do you have any disclaimers before we get started on this one? Yeah, my portion, we didn't do that last time. We were supposed to edit that in. My portion definitely has some violence and death and um, animal abuse. Sorry, PETA. And if the sound quality is bad on this one, sorry guys, our uh, microphone quit, so we're literally recording it from her phone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm Cassie. I'm Stuart. My side of the story, I've only got one disclaimer. If you have phytophobia um, or the fear of snakes, you might have a minor trigger warning. So, that's what we got. Do it. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> All right. I'm going to talk about, I have my notes titled as The Children. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> but really the story, it starts with the Son of Sam killings. Do you know anything about that? Um, I know a little bit about Son of Sam, um, but I'm... Sure, I'm going to learn a lot more. For all my serial killer aficionados like me, here's a little deeper dive into the Son of Sam story. We're going to take a look into a journalist, Maury Terry's take on the investigation of the Son of Sam killings and um, his own personal investigation that he started. So the Son of Sam murders happened in New York City from the summer of 76 going into February of 77, something like that. Okay. Six people were killed, another seven injured um, with a 44 caliber revolver. Um, police believe they found their man, David Berkowitz. He's right. from Yonkers. Um, so in comes Maury Terry. He lived right up the street from Berkowitz in Yonkers. Um, at the time of the crimes, he was convinced from the beginning that the son of Sam did not act alone, so he decided to investigate it. Okay. Um, now the police sketches they had of the suspects looked like Berkowitz, so number one red flag there. Uh, yeah. Berkowitz had a neighbor named Sam Carr. Sam's dog was supposed to be the dog that told Berkowitz to kill all those people. Um, Sam Carr had two sons, John and Michael. And they were friend, rumored to be friends with Berkowitz. And well, the dog definitely was, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, John Carr went to high school with Maury, actually. Um, so that's just a little peek into some of the people that may possibly be involved. Okay. Um, two of the women that were sh shot survived. And the composite sketch that they provided looked exactly like John Carr. Exactly like John Carr? Yeah. The the neighbor of um, John Berkowitz, yes. Oh. I mean, John Berkowitz. Dave Berkowitz. Jesus. Okay. Stacy um, Markowitz and her boyfriend, Robert Violante. Viol 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 both shot. They were both shot in the head and Robert survived. Sorry, Robert, for butchering your name. The sketches of the shooter were completely different from Berkowitz. It was a guy with light brown hair that was tall and thin. The witness to the shooting never believed it was Berkowitz from the from the day one. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of David Berkowitz, but... Well, I was going to say, isn't David Berkowitz like a short, stocky, got dark curly hair kind of guy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah okay. for sure. So, um, actually, in that shooting, another witness saw him getting a parking ticket the same time, and it was, like, four blocks away. Wow. So he can either run really, really fast, or he's uh, got a doppelganger? Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, got it. <laughs> sure. Witnesses at the scene of that shooting <clears throat> saw a yellow VW at the shooting, and Berkowitz drove a Ford. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. So, another one of the witness sketches lo actually did look like Michael Carr, too, when you put them next to a picture of him. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, at that point, like, just, like, in the very beginning, like, their names were in the 
the phone book. Oh. Yeah. Maury's like, let's go to the police. Um, the end, the NYPD is like, now nah, we got our guy. Maury thought, well, they're going to come back to me anyways, because the NYPD found Berkowitz on that parking ticket. Right. Um, that's how they found him. They were looking at parking tickets from the days of the shootings okay. and they showed up at his house and they found his car and they illegally searched his car and found the 44. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then they waited for Berkowitz to come out of his apartment and, um, Immediately, he's like, you caught me. I'm the son of Sam. Oh, so didn't have to worry about the illegal search and seizure or anything. <laughs> well, actually, um, they arrested him, and they were fully prepared to go to court, even with no evidence. But he publicly, in the courthouse, um, confessed to all of the murders and pleaded guilty. Oh, so, yeah, it never even went to trial. Um, so NYPD is like, case closed. Nothing to look at here, you know. Yeah. Um, Maury's like, fuck that. I'm digging deeper in this anyways, because the other killers are still out there and could kill again. Mm -hmm. We love, we love this Maury Terry. He's not taking it the easy way out. So Maury head ba heads back to the neighborhood. Berkowitz's stopping grounds. He starts asking around about Berkowitz and meets a local teen who takes him down to a trail right next to the cars in Berkowitz's houses. Okay. The trail led to this old Croton cro aqueduct, a hundred okay. hundred year old tunnel system that ran along the Hudson River that's directly under an old estate now known as Untermyer Park. Oh. Yeah. Maury takes his buddy down to the park later and shows them the aqueducts and they found dead German shepherds. Oh no. I know. Oh no. Yeah. The dogs were mutilated brutally, and that's about as far as I can go into that. Mm. Then they found an old abandoned pump house in the park, whatever that means. Yeah. But it's like a creepy cement building when I, I saw the pictures. And it had like satanic symbols painted in blood on the wall. Uh, of course it did. Yeah. And there were blood stains all over the place. And this place was called by the locals the Devil's Cave. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. There were reports of chanting being heard there, and a security guard saw people in hoods and robes. Here we get to the culty part. It was rumored to be a meeting place for a group that called themselves the Children. Uh -huh. Um, all of that was a less than a mile away from Berkowitz and the car homes. The the park. No. Oh. Okay. So, um, Maury takes a closer look at these Son of Sam letters, which I have copies of. Uh -huh. Um, when the shootings were happening, they were sending letters to the police and the newspapers taunting them. And Maury finds they're kind of littered with occult references. Imagine that. Yeah. He refers himself to Beelzebub. That's in re reference to a Lord of the Flies demon. Right. Then Brat, known as an imp or small devil. Um, at the end of one of the letters, he says, I'll be back. I'll be back. Which, I mean, he could just be saying that he was planning on killing some people. But it was spoken by Satan in a book called The Black Easter. Oh, okay. Yeah. There was also a club called Eliphas. I hope I'm saying that right. Was a, It was associated with the group. And Eliphas Levi was this big black magician in the 1800s. Yeah. Um, there was the symbol in the letter that was pretty close to the symbol that Eliphas Levi drew himself. And along the outer perimeter of the symbol that Elvis drew was a word, Berkael. Oh. Kind of seems close to Berkowitz, right? right? Mm. And then a Maserac. And I know, like, satanic cults tend to, like, rearrange words or do words backwards, like records backwards and stuff. Well, if you, like, if you do a Maserac backwards and kind of rearrange the letters, it, it spells Sam Carr. But, I mean, that's kind of freaky, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the le the letters also referenced pathways where things were happening, like the pathways to the aqueducts near the house. Oh, oh okay. Right? Yeah. So, you know, I'm just uh, writing it out for you and you're not listening. Yeah, it's insanely obvious. And um, the paths were also known as the gutters. And in one of the letters, it starts out with hello from the gutters. <laughs> like it's actually spray painted on... Like a like a wall, a cement wall there, the gutters. Oh, jeez. Yeah. John Carr had the nickname John Weedy, 
because his sister's name was Wheat or something like that. And the letters he made a list of people that are involved. And one of them was John Wheaty. Okay. He was also like listed in the phone book as John Wheat Carr. Oh. <laughs> well. Yeah. The Carr's brother's dad, Sam, was rumored in the neighborhood to be a really miserable pe person and abusive to his kids. And he used to lock them in the attic and different things of that late nature. In those letters, it said, Papa Sam locks us in the attic and he beats his family. Oh, such a wonderful father figure. Yeah. And there was something about wicked um, wicker and the Carr family lived on Wicker Street. Oh. So. Good Lord. Fe February 17th, 1978, just six months after David Berkowitz was arrested, John Carr was found dead in his girlfriend's ap apartment in Minot, North Dakota. Oh, okay. And it was described as a questionable shooting <coughs> suicide. So Maury goes out there and meets John's friends who admit that they knew Berkowitz. Also that they saw John drawing, or the symbol, for the, the symbol that, that was in the letters, four months before the letters were sent to the police. The group of friends in North Dakota said John was the leader of the group, that he performed rituals where he killed shepherds, and they drank the blood. Oh, oh no. no. No, 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 no. All... Also, they said Berkowitz had visited Minot before. And he, John also went to a counselor after Berkowitz was apprehended in Dakota to like a walk-in therapy clinic. Mm -hmm. He said he thought someone was trying to kill him, that he may be in trouble back in New York, and that he knew David Berkowitz and he had information the police in New York would like to know. Oh, I bet he did. Yeah. He also admitted to the counselor he was involved with a group of people doing satanic rituals. All of that information was sent to the New York City's DA office by the Minot Police Department, and not just by Maury Terry, but they were ignored. Oh. Oh, Jesus. They're doing wonderful police work, let me tell you. <laughs> then Michael Carr dies in a questionable car accident in New York on the highway in October of 79. And how is it questionable? He hit a telephone pole, like, head-on. Oh. Going something like 95 miles an hour on the highway in the middle of the city. I mean, that's very possible. Yeah. But people said there were tire marks on the scene suggesting he was ran off the road. Oh, that, that makes it questionable. Yeah. Yes. Okay. But it was never solved. Of course not. Yeah. When Berkowitz was asked about the young deaths of his friends later on in an interview, he said... I'm not surprised. There's a price to pay. What usually happens to people involved in the occult is the tragic auto accident, or, you know, the freak accident, and they're gone. Um, snitches wind up in ditches. <laughs> At this point, Maury has gotten newspapers to pick up on this story, and even surviving victims of the Son of Sam killings and families of the victims are like, what the fuck? Right. Like, it seems like it's so obvious, like, now, looking at all of it together. Mm -hmm. So the Queen's DA decides to look into it further, finally. And John Carr's sister, Weedy, admits to the DA that John was involved in the occult. But that's, like, all the information I found about the Queen's DNA, like, deciding to look into it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, John, Maury finds out that John and Michael Carr were originally Scientologists. And Michael was in a high level of Scientology. Hell, that's a cult in its own right. Mm -hmm. There was also a group that kept coming up that was originated in Scientology called the Process Church of the Final Judgment. Creepy sounding, right? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, originated in the UK, started in 1963, a satanic cult devoted to bringing on the end of the world. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they wore black robes with big silver crosses, and they liked having German shepherds as pets. No, no, see why? The, see the... Yeah. They had seminars in the 60s where they teach their teachings in the U.S. in a lot of major cities, and New York City being one of them, and in California. Oh. In yeah, including the hate ashbury District. Sound oh. familiar? A little bit. It's in California. Mm -hmm. The leaders of the process church in that time, one of their neighbors was 
Charles Manson. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. The one and only. The one that ta taught starting the apocalypse with a race war. Charles Manson, who had his followers commit seemingly random acts of violence to induce chaos. Hmm. Which is similar to the son of Sam Kellings in a way. Yeah. Manson, Manson also wrote an excerpt in a magazine made by the process. And members of the process church visit him in jail. Now what's on the record for the process church, which I'm not going to deep in, dig too deep into that because I might want to use that one later, is that they ended up breaking up because of their association with Mark and Charles Manson. No. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So, but in the seventies, the process church went underground and split into branches in the, into the U S one might believe one of those branches is in New York. Mm -hmm. Satanic group called the children. Uh, yeah. I mean, Hey, um, Berkowitz did send a letter to Maureen. Okay. Um, saying that it was basically all true that he was in a cult and all that. And he did not act alone. Um, he also sent cryptic shit to the police in North Dakota with a book about witchcraft. Oh, jeez. Yeah, and inside it notes about someone who was followed and killed in California, and he wrote her name in the book. Oh. Arliss Perry. She was 19 years old. Oh, no. She was found dead in a church with huge church candles shoved up her vagina. Oh, God. <clears throat> And an ice pick shoved into her skull. Oh, no. Yeah. That's she, not as bad as the first one. Yeah. She was said to be really religious and from Bismarck, North Dakota. Oh, the tie-in, <laughs> let me tell you. Going to school in Stanford. So she was in this church pray alone and was accidentally locked it. Accidentally. Locked in the church with her murderer. Oh, Yeah. There was speculation that when she was still lived in North Dakota, she tried to convert cult members into Christianity. Okay. And Berkowitz insinuated in that letter that the cult followed her to kill her in California. Hmm. But none of that's really on the record. Um, Berkowitz also sent a letter to the California police and told them he knew someone in the New York cult that admitted to killing her. And the California police come, came up to New York to try to talk to him, but he clammed up and stopped talking to people um, right about the time that, that they came up to New York because um, he didn't stop talking to the Bronx DA about opening the cakes back up because someone tried to cut his throat in prison. I was just about to say, I mean, if there's people disappearing and dying that are related to this cult thing, wouldn't you want to hide from it? Yeah, and he was really concerned about his dad. I'm sorry about background noise. I fidget a lot and I vape. So after around this time when uh, Berkowitz decides that he's going to clam up and not talk anymore, um, Maury starts getting letters from one of Berkowitz's former cellmates. He says, the former cellmate, that one of the Son of Sam shootings was filmed as a snuff film and sold to the highest bidder. Oh. And and this guy, Ron Sisman, Sisman, filmed these snuff films. So Maury looks into Ron. Ron was a photographer. Mm. Ron was mysteriously shot and killed in the back of the head with his girlfriend killed the same way next to him on Halloween. And the case was never solved. Oh. Yeah. There, um, in these letters, um, Ron, the former cellmate, Insinuated that Ron had a friend in the Hamptons who loved snuff films, and that's who he was making them for. And he was coded in the letters as RR. And one of Maury's friends actually knew people in, from the Hamptons in the crowd and figured it had to be this millionaire named Roy Radin that lives in that area. And there was actually like this millionaire documentary piece I saw a little bit of about him. And one of the quotes, I shit you not, was Roy loves sex parties in his 72 room Long Island mansion. Don't you? Okay. <laughs> I mean, to each their own, but damn. Well, a girl was raped and beaten by, by him at one of these parties for refusing to participate. So not one of those sex parties that big, that's big on consent. 
<laughs> yeah, doesn't appear so. Yeah. So when the police raided his house for the rape, they found that found that he had taped it himself. Oh. Um, himself course. raping her. Yeah. Well, Roy was shot in the back of the head and dumped into a California canyon. So he got what he fucking deserved. It's, it appears so. Yeah. So Maury goes down to California to talk to the police, shows them all of his evidence, and the police are like, "Well, this tracks." So the police tell him where the body was found, and he finds a Bible buried inside, like a, inside of a tree, right by where the man was found. Body was found. Creepy. Yeah. And it was open to some creepy part about death. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Like something about let us eat, so because soon we we will be dead. So after this, Maury wrote a book. It's called The Ultimate Evil. Um, that's also the name of the Netflix docu series that got me into the story. Um, after the book, Maury rose to popularity. He was on a lot of um, talk shows and, and a lot of newspapers and stuff. And in 1993, Berkowitz had converted to Christianity, and he decided to have a sit down with Maury on film. So it's literally documented on film that, that David Berkowitz, the son of Sam Killer, admits that he did not act alone, that John and Michael Carr were involved, and that they were involved in a cult. Oh, jeez. Yeah. He went through and said who he did actually shoot and who he didn't. Berk Berkowitz will still only name the Carr brothers as being a part of it. He admits that there were others involved, but he won't name any other names. I mean, like I said... Um, Maury continued to investigate things further with his friends that he gained through his popularity from the book. Actually, one of the people that was shot in the Son of Sam shootings and survived saw the interview with Berkowitz and saw him say that he didn't shoot him. So he decided to join in on the investigation. Oh, which okay. I thought was kind of cool. Yeah. They ended up finding people that were members of this cult, the Children and Yonkers. Only one talked to them, though. Ah, uh, yeah. One actually committed suicide after he was questioned by them. Or was it? Yeah. And the others lawyered up or just wouldn't talk. Right. The one that did talk said he was part of it as a freshman in high school and was approached by John Carr to be a part of the group. Mm hmm And he thought it was just a group of friends all fun and games playing around with some druid rit rituals in the woods. And then it turned into killing dogs and he's like, what the fuck, dude? Yeah, I'd be out right then. then yeah, too. same. He also admitted they were involved in making pornography and peddling drugs. Oh, yeah. fine. Maury did eventually meet people that admitted that his children were the, an offshoot of the process, but there's no, like, actual, like, proof of that. Okay. Um, and Maury went back and interviewed Berkowitz a second time, and he did kind of say yes to it being an offshoot of the process, but... And it was on TV, but both of the interviews were kind of interpreted especially the second one were interpreted that um maury was kind of leading berkowitz on with leading questions like is it true that you were in a cult and well, then he would be like yeah yes i was now see like it's an interview not an interrogation yeah but so david berkowitz kind of made it clear that he didn't want to talk about it like he was happy with christianity and trying to move on and maury was kind of pushy well, I mean, you're trying to get the truth. You're trying to get the truth, right? Yeah. I don't believe him. I don't blame him, yeah. So, when the interviews went out both times, the Bronx DA, the NYPD, ne and the NYPD never reopened the case. Of course not. And to this day, it's on record that Berkowitz acted alone. Jeez. Um, Maury never stopped working on this story, though, because he wanted other, the other people responsible to be held accountable. Yeah. He also had reason to believe that the cult had ties to child trafficking and child pornography and just sex trafficking in general. Well, fucking so, of course. The story is not just about a cult, but it's also about the occult. Yeah, oh. <laughs> a conspiracy and Maury Terry. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> The NYP did, PD did everything they could to make Maury Terry look like a crazy conspiracy theorist, though, and a crackpot, and he never got the credit he deserved for all of that dedication and time. Um, and sadly, he died, died of congestive heart failure in December of 2015. Oh, no. Yeah. It was said that even on his deathbed, he was still making phone calls and investigating the cult. That is a dedicated man yeah. right there. But I'm going to end it on a quote 
From David Berkowitz to a letter that he wrote Maury Terry, Maury, the public will never truly believe you no matter how well your evidence is presented. Oh, I know. It's shitty. Yeah. So that was my story. So, you know, okay. <clears throat> he, David Berkowitz, mm-hmm. openly admits to this, and the NYC... NYPD. They refuse to even look into this? Like, is there ever specified a reason why, or is it just under the assumption that, you know... Well, I think it's because they feel like there was a lot of mistakes made, and it's kind of covered up. I think... Not they feel like. That's how I feel, and that's kind of how it was insinuated in the research yeah. that I did, is that they were kind of trying to cover up the, their fuck-up on that one. Well, I mean, if you consider the fact that we started out with a very simple, um, oh, you know, illegal search and seizure. Yeah. That that would definitely, I mean, that would definitely insinuate that, yeah, there was some shit that was done wrong. Yeah. I mean, I have the letters. Oh, okay. I don't really, it's, they're really sick and twisted, but I will read them. It's like five letters. All right, so we've got, I am deeply hurt by your calling me a woman hater. I am not, but I am a monster. I am the son of Sam. I am a little brat. When Father Sam gets drunk, he gets mean. He beats his family sometimes. He ties me up to the back of the house. Other times he locks me in the garage. Sam loves to drink blood. Go out and kill, commands Father Sam. Behind our house, some rest, mostly young, raped, and slaughtered. Their blood drained, just bones now. Oh no. Papa Sam keeps me locked in the attic too. I can't get out, but I look out the attic window and watch the world go by. I feel like an outsider. I am on a different wavelength than everybody. Programmed to kill. However, to stop me, you must kill me. Attention all police. Shoot me first. Shoot to kill or else. Keep out of my way or you will die. Papa Sam is old now. He needs some blood to preserve his youth. He has had too many heart attacks. Too many heart attacks. Ah, me heart hurts, sonny boy. I miss my pretty princess most of all. She's resting in Our Lady's house, but I'll see her soon. I am the monster, Beelzebub, the chubby behemoth. I love to hunt, prowling the streets, looking for fair game, tasty meat. The women uh, women of Queens are the prettiest of all. I must be the water they drink. I live for the hunt. My life, blood for Papa. Mr. Borelli, sir, I don't want to kill any more. No, sir, no more. But I must honor thy father. I want to make love to the world. I love people. I don't belong on earth. Return me to the yahoos. <laughs> okay. To the people of Queens, I love you. And I want to wish all of you a happy Easter. May God bless you in this life and in the next for now. I say goodbye and good night. Police, let me haunt you with these words. I'll be back. I'll be back. To be interpreted as bang, 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 bang. Ugh. Yours in murder, Mr. Monster. Well, that was just weird. Not knowing what the future holds, I shall say farewell, and I will see you at the next job. Or should I say, you will see my handiwork at the next job. Remember, Miss Loria. Thank you. In their blood and from the gutter, Sam's creation, 44. Here are some names to help you along. Forward them to the inspector for use by NCIC. The Duke of Death. The Wicked King Wicker. The 22 Disciples of Hell. John Wheaties, Rapist and Suffocator of Young Girls. P.S. J.B. Please inform all the detectives working the slayings to remain. Hmm. So wait, hold on. First of all, I gotta say that, uh, one, I'm very impressed that you can read his horrible chicken scratch. (laughs) 
he, oh, look at this freaking cursive though. So he wrote these this letter to his neighbor yeah. and they compared it to prove that it was his handwriting. But first of all, they don't look alike at all. No, absolutely not. But second of all, I can't read it at all. Oh jeez. <laughs> that somebody typed it here. But the other thing I was gonna say is that last letter, like based on what you just explained about the the neighbor and the cult group and all that stuff he literally puts it out verbatim hey this is something else you should look into mm -hmm. this name this name this name this name bam what so this is the last one Ooh. and actually these are the letters that he wrote to his neighbor craig above mm. it yeah. craig glassman where he's threatening to curse his mother's grave and piss on her grave, and her, that his mouth and says that his mouth is full of cum. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah, but any I'm yeah, not going to read that whole one because it's long. But the last letter was because Craig is Craig, so must the streets be filled with Craig. In parentheses, death. Okay, well. And then it says, and huge drops of lead poured down upon her head until she was dead. Yet the cats still come out n at night to mate. And the sparrows still sing in the morning. I feel like I've heard that somewhere other than this, but yeah. Um, so, since you're obviously not looking at this, uh, the listeners, the symbol itself—imagine, if you will, like a giant X on the page with arrows on each yeah, corner. Yeah, arrows on each end. So, if you want to get mathematical, they're rays. Um, and the left side. Nerd. You, shush. The the left side of the the arrow or the um, X. X is the male symbol. I want to say no. That's that's the female symbol. So like your circle with a stick figure, and then it has an S in the bottom, and a cross above the S, and then on the far right it has the male symbol, the circle pointing. Oh, this arrow is, pointing up. This is what they sent to somebody sent to. Um... And that's why we drink um, P.O. Box. It was just a letter with just that symbol on it. Oh, and that's didn't not know what it fucking means. creepy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, is that what is that what they were referencing? Yeah. Oh, I didn't catch that. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, by the way, we're going to plug our favorite podcast, and that's why we drink. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. But what do you think? Are you convinced that it was a cult? I mean, I have do a... I have you convinced? <laughs> I... After hearing everything that was... Presented, yeah, I, I kind of have a feeling there's, a, it's a little culty. Yeah. All right, that's what I had. Okay. So, what is that that you have, good sir, for me? <laughs> okay, weirdo. <laughs> Jeez. Stop. You hit. You know I hate mouth noises. Ah. <laughs> anyway, so what I have, well. Before I get to that, how about this? First, um, by the time this episode airs, it'll be Memorial Day. So, happy Memorial Day. Um, I hate saying it that way, but that is what it is. Um, and the other is, uh, how about a random fact of the day? I'm, I'm here for it. Alright, so, text messages sent by an eagle actually bankrupted the research project the research project of what you confused yeah yes. okay okay yeah. so russian scientists were tracking the flight pattern of a of an eagle okay mm -hmm. and when they were doing this they attached a tracker to an eagle and the tracker is text based well this being in like 90s late 90s early 2000s um it was 77 cents a text message and the, the eagle flew from russia to iran and i quote the charges were sky high <laughs> so when, when the when the eagle returned it actually uh they got the bill and it was so intensely expensive that they literally went bankrupt. They couldn't even fulfill the, the whole research project because of it. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, that's messed up. <laughs> so, um, disclaimer before I uh, get into this. You already did a disclaimer. Well, it's not the disclaimer about people 
having fears or anything like this. It's because I am not from India and can't pronounce shit to save my life. (laughs) These names are from India itself. Um, They are different regions, and I get into that a little bit more. But uh, this is the story of Uttara Hooter. Hater. Hooter. (laughs) Hutter. 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 And Sharada. Sharada? No. Sharada. Sharada. Yeah, I actually wrote pronunciations. Oh, okay. To help myself. I'm so proud of you. (laughs) Yeah, well, I try. (laughs) I'm not going to guarantee it. I love you. (laughs) Yeah, well... I love you too. <laughs> Hopefully this works. Um, all right. So at age 32, I'm just going to call her U from U for Udara and S for Sharada because it will save me time. No, you have to say Sharada you, every time. Don't you dare. <laughs> so at age 32, all personal memories and total personality abruptly changes in you to a woman named Sharada who lived 150 years prior to you okay so we're gonna start with uh fidgeting yeah we're gonna start with you first um so she was born on the 14th of march 1941 her father's name is gm Hutter, Manora Ma, Hutter, okay, um, and this was in Na- Nagpur Maharashtra. Sh- Say mm-hmm. that five times fast. Yeah, believe me. <laughs> India. India. Yeah. So, <laughs> so in the Nagpur region, okay, you have to have to realize this is like in the 40s and you know you go 32 years later it's in the 70s okay so dialect is still a thing and i believe based on what i read in my research they speak different they look different they do different so we are this and they're that that so Mm -hmm. that becomes a big part in understanding why it's kind of a big deal do you know anything about reincarnation a little bit. A little bit. Well, this is apparently one of the most infamous cases of reincarnation. And I can only claim that because that's what I searched and it's the only top story that came up. There's plenty of reincarnation stories, but this one is apparently so big that it's hmm. still being researched. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm here for it. Yeah. So her use mom... Uh, states that while she was pregnant with you, she actually had a reoccurring dream about being bitten on her toe by one of a very venomous snake. Okay? They stopped immediately after she was born. Uh, As a child, you had a severe, not even just a little bit, she had a severe phobia of snakes between the ages of five to eight. Okay. All right? So it kind of ties in a little bit. Um, she was she was raised in Murati speaking home. That is the dialect of this Maharashtra. I tried. You. I tried. You, okay. You put in a real effort. I yeah. love you for it. It's okay. <laughs> um, so you got it, baby. to to correlate the in school. Uh, you became completely fascinated by learning about learning the Bengali culture and and everything to do with Bengali, including the movies and books. And she actually preferred Bengali female heroines over the Maharati, which is kind of a big no no in for for their cultural thing. Um, but she claimed that they were just more courageous and more feminine okay. interesting right after high school she went to uh they call it university um i guess we're in a in america we're the only ones that call it going to college mm-hmm. 
Um, <clears throat> she wound up getting her master's in English in 1969, her second master's in public administration in 1971. Wow, for her. So she's a very intelligent woman. She's not like some Joe Schmo off the street trying to make a claim. Like she, she knows her stuff. But around 24, um, she actually was rejected for marriage. And then shortly thereafter, her father died. Mm-hmm. So she's going through a really rough patch and kind of leads into what people are like, can try to fight the reincarnation statement. But anyway, um, it leads her to pursuing a full spirit spirituality lifestyle. Mm-hmm. So head to the church and stay there. Um, but... That, spirituality and as in the belief of ghosts or spirituality as in just religion religion okay uh we're talking india it's like all about uh india has a higher population of hindu yeah so they're the reincarnates believe don't touch you know don't touch life don't hurt life you know so on and so forth mm-hmm. but the interesting fact about this is she's been 100% healthy her whole life. They they claim that, like, she might have had to go to the doctor a couple times for, you know, standard cough. Cold. Yeah. But... The stuff the kids have been through, pretty much. Yeah. Minor injuries that turned into major oh, ER yeah. visits. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's not get into that one. Oh, God. Uh, but right after her father dies and she... Um, is rejected for marriage, which is actually a very big thing. Like, I can't explain how big of a deal it is for a woman to be rejected to be married. Um, she winds up getting a whole bunch of health issues, including she gets asthma. This woman's been breathing just fine her whole life. All of a sudden, she has asthma. It's not abnormal, but it's not normal either. I was going to say, I didn't have asthma. I wasn't diagnosed with asthma until I was 21. Right, so like I said, it's not abnormal, but it's not really normal either, you know, to just suddenly have it. But then all of a sudden she also has gynecological issues, like serious gynecological issues. Yeah, and to make matters worse, they can't figure out why or what's making the problem. Uh, That's what it says, unable to be determined by medical scientists from 17 different regions. Mm. And... I have this problem, so I understand how much of a pain in the butt it is. Eczema. Eczema sucks. Yeah. And to have skin, breathing, and to the ladies, your vaginal problems get extremely off the uh, deep end. Oh that... my god, she must be crawling out of her skin. Right. So, 19- 19... ADHD sidebar. <laughs> yeah. Not a large one, but I work, what I do for a living is um, I work in a group home for adults with disabilities. And um, I can't really talk about them, but, I mean, that work is my life, besides my family, obviously. Mm. And I'll just say that I deal with eczema in my work, and it's not fun for anybody. And you deal with eczema at home because I got it. (laughs) Yeah. It sucks, all right? Listen, it just... Anyway, moving on. (laughs) So, because of all these health issues that suddenly arise out of nowhere, um, in 1973, she gets hospitalized for treatments, like inpatient hospitalization. She, they can't figure out what's going on. They're trying to treat her. Um, But suddenly, she feels drawn to her doctor. And I quote, Utera, Utera, um, I quote, like an iron particle to a magnet. So, also just showing she's still very intelligent because who the hell... Even uses that as a a, a point of reference. Right. What? Yeah. I mean, so yeah, there's that. Um, And then she starts writing in her diary uh, multiple times uh, throughout the stay, just trying to keep herself, her sanity. But her poems and entries start to allude to the changing um, coming very soon. So this is where people are like, oh, maybe it's a, not a thing. Her, her being reincarnated all of a sudden. After a major meditation session with a visiting yogi, mm-hmm. that's actually what it's called, not Yogi the Bear, just... 
Yeah, I know. Yeah, not Yogi the Bear. Sorry. Um, <laughs> and then I have I have in big bold explanation point letters the change. Uh, so, <laughs> dun dun dun. Right. So she starts being very quiet and very distant and even tries to leave the hospital in search of a place where she thought she belonged. And that's a direct quote from her. Well, this is totally abnormal because she's very socialite. She's, you know, she's comfortable. She's trying to get through her medical issues. Now she's distant. Like, I'm deucing out. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, it it's. Sucks to be sick. It does suck to be sick, but it's also abnormal when this entire time she's just been very social mm -hmm. but here's the weird part she starts speaking bengali she can't speak or understand her own language like they even question her um and it's brought up that like her brother studied bengali and stuff like this but he can't speak the language um her dad can't speak it her mom can't speak it her whole family can't speak bengali Right. They can barely, barely translate some of it just by context clues. Later, she states, uh, he, he's her husband reincarnate. The, the doctor that she's been, you know, attracted to in uh, like a iron particle to a magnet. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, she later states that like she she felt so attracted to him and started treating him like like he's he's her husband instead of her doctor Creepy. so yeah like she starts i don't i don't know how to really explain the cultural difference but in what i know of indian culture is like women are are to bow down to their husbands basically mm -hmm. it's a very very structured thing there but for her to do that to not just because he's a man but her doctor it's not not a thing so it becomes kind of weird and they start like really starting to ask her questions and stuff like that mm -hmm. and when i don't i don't remember exactly what they said but she had like a a very weird lapse moment where she was just totally silent, didn't do anything, uh, sat and stared out a window for, I think, 24 hours. And they thought she had a minor stroke. Okay. So they come and ask her, um, you know, hey, do you know your name? And she goes, yeah, it's Sharada. And they're like, eh, no, it's not. <laughs> So, did you have a stroke? <laughs> right. So, you know, they did an extensive test and all this stuff. But she starts giving details about her life in a village that's over 450 miles away. Holy shit. Yeah. And, you know, so they start, they start doing, like, writing down what she's saying and doing a little bit of research. And her, the, the reason why this is... Uh, kind of reported on a lot is it's actually her brother who's been with her this entire time is taking notes of all this and so he takes it to his father says hey this is what she's saying it's totally weird but i kind of feel like maybe we should look into this and they find they find this woman and her family and everybody and all the details match to a t creepy yeah so over the next 30 years, 30 years of dealing with this, her personality switches Wait, from day to day. Wait, they found Shabada? Well, like, was she, she was dead? Was she alive? Yeah, they found, hold on, I'm getting there. <clears throat> I, I do actually have okay. where okay. they investigated I'm this. I'm skipping ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's only two bullet points ahead. Reverse. But, <laughs> but, so over the next 30 years, you know, her, her personality switches between you and us, like, like that, just all like multiple personality disorder. Right, yeah. and I also hit that here in just a moment too. Um, so, the brother who is writing this out actually states that S's appearance was brief in time, like it was at most a twenty-four hour period where she is S <laughs> Sharada, um, but there'd be like. 
weeks at a time where she would be herself, she'd be back to normal, you know, just trying to get through her medical problems, and then, bam, she's S again, and wondering if anybody's ever going to go check on her grandkids and stuff like that. Actually states, uh, if someone is going to check on my grandchildren. Okay. Yeah. So, we get into the investigation. Two colleagues, Stevenson and 100% could not pronounce, even tried to look up the pronunciation, so we're just going to write mm, pronunciation. Nope. <laughs> so, two colleagues, uh, Dr. Stevenson and this other guy. <laughs> uh, just this other guy. Yeah. Just classic other guy. Sorry, that there was too many consonants, not enough vowels. <laughs> uh, well, they discovered the whole situation um, in a paper on the 18th of February, 1975. Okay. So they head to Nagpur and uh, to interview Udara. Um, they actually recorded the interview, like video and audio recorded this, okay? On July 2nd, 1975, they talked to S. 100% you can tell from minutes before and seconds into it, they are 100% different people. Just language, dialect, mannerisms, everything changes on. That's wild. Like, yeah, at the snap of a finger. Unbelievable. <laughs> Inconceivable. Uh, on October seventy, on um, in October, nineteen seventy-five to November nineteen seventy-seven, they did five more visits that had reincarnation researchers. Four out of the five, they talked to S. And they like they're a hundred percent like nope that's definitely a different person. Um, in May of nineteen seventy five, um, one of the researchers actually goes and visits the. They said ancestors, but I know that is not the right word, it, because your ancestors are prior to you. Yes. Your predecessor. Uh, that's not right. Uh, descendants. There you go, descendants. Your descendants. <laughs> They go and visit descendants of S. They inter they interview more than 25 people. And they visit a major Indian library. Uh, don't ask me which one because they don't claim which one. They just said major Indian library. Okay, the major yeah. Indian library. <laughs> um, so they, they found death record, um, estate deeds. They found, they found the, the deeds records of S. Okay. Like so, they have proof. Okay. So she's... she is dead. Yeah. Okay. So Got they have it. they have proof. She was a hundred and fifty years prior to this event. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, and they have her family records and stuff like that. So they've they've talked to everybody, and they're like, yeah, it's kind of crazy. These are actually the details of her life that S is talking about. Through you. Yeah, through you. Um, so they do they do brain scans. Um, just nothing abnormal. They, she has, even when she is claiming to be S, they can't explain a brain scan. But basically, the colors are the same. The shape is a little different. But it does not mean it's an abnormality. Like, no issues. Now, the interesting fact, though, you remember back in the beginning and we talked about the, uh, Ophidophobia? Mm -hmm. The fear of snakes? Um... She had the fear of snakes between five and eight, like a severe one. Mm -hmm. And her mother had that reoccurring dream. Yeah, I was wondering when this was going to come up yeah. again. Guess what's on her death certificate? What? Cause of death. Snake bite. Snake bite. Fucking creepy. To her left big toe. What the fuck, dude? Yeah. And India has like some of the most deadliest snakes in yeah. the world. If so. you ever hear about me going to a trip to India, I did not go there. Somebody kidnapped me. And <laughs> right. Just, just save it up. Um, so, in 1984, Stevenson himself uh, publishes a book where he transcripts all the interviews and everything going on. He has pictures and he has copies of the evidence they found in the libraries and interviews with these uh, descendants and everything. Now... Here's uh, you're gonna you're gonna love my third bullet on why <laughs> what critics say about 
what this actually could possibly be. Multiple personalities. Right? right. So that's one of them. They believe it could be disassociative identity disorder, multiple personality disorder, and she there's a chance that she studied Bengali enough to be able to fake it. Okay? Or as you remember, her father died and she got rejected from marriage at this like roughly the same time. Mm-hmm. Well, they believe there's a possibility maybe she just had a mental breakdown and it just so happens that she can come across these. Mm-hmm. But best of one of all, my last bullet point. What if she's just possessed? <laughs> literally is written down there. By the ghost? Yeah, it's literally written in there that um, the, by by a scientist of all people is like, what if she's just possessed? <laughs> and I'm like, really? Just, just possessed? You know? And, but yeah, so that's the reincarnation situation. I wish I had more details about S's story, but the only articles that I found on this it was basically everybody reiterating the exact same article because it's the brothers big deal and the book the book published by Stevenson isn't available anymore I've looked for it 100% you cannot purchase that book anywhere I totally found the book by Maury Terry on Audible I was gonna listen to it oh okay (laughs) that'll be fun so yeah, what, uh, what do you think about um, reincarnation and the possibility that this woman is literally flipping switches? I'm me one second and them the next. Um, well, I don't believe in any religion, right? Specifically, but if I was going to believe in one, I would prefer to believe in reincarnation because it sounds nice. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> But, I mean, if what they're saying is true, I mean, it kind of feels like proof, but she could also be just full of shit, so. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay, so you did drop, like, our favorite podcast so far is, and this is why we drink. She actually talks about reincarnation in an episode. Um, The M talks about reincarnation in an episode. And there are so many unexplainable stories where it may be just a glimpse because, like, Um, Oh, remembering your past life. Right, remembering a past life or, or, you know, coincidence that, hey, like, father served with guy named child after a guy served with that died, and all of a sudden he's like, she talks about this one specifically, that's, I'm just kind of summarizing it, maybe. Spark notes. (laughs) Um, Fun fact about me is that, like, I don't know why, but if it's my mental illnesses, ADHD or my drug use or trauma. To be clear, drug (laughs) use is only marijuana. Yes. (laughs) Well, not when I was a teenager, but I experimented in a lot of different things. But, or just trauma from my life. But I have a really poor memory, but I do, I had a lot of weird dreams as a kid. One that was really freaky. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, but I can remember having reoccurring dreams of being, like, in olden times, like, in a maid's uniform. Oh, yeah. Like, okay, so you, you know that I journal a lot. Yes. I actually have... A diary. It's it's a journal. (laughs) Um, I actually have, I don't remember what year it was, but I wrote down in there about a weird reoccurring dream that was... Uh, I want to say up to a month that I was having the same dream and it was always from the viewpoint like it wasn't like I could look at myself or whatever third person view but I was always approaching a woman um, who had red hair like the reddest red hair ever and she was wearing an emerald dress with like this big jewel thing hanging around her neck and um, I actually found a picture of a painting Of this woman. She's somebody in Ireland. Okay. I didn't catch the name because it was written in Celt. uh, Celtic. And I was like, yeah, no, don't have, don't have time to translate. And it was back way enough that Google Translate wasn't a thing yet. (laughs) So. Oh, man. First world problems. Right. (laughs) So. 
but it was it was kind of interesting that like I actually found the person and she's from Ireland and maybe mistaken but I'm pretty sure I have it's either Irish or Scottish so that's uh, that's that's what I got <laughs> so that's that yeah I mean it's kind of a convincing argument per se mm-hmm. for for reincarnation yeah and you know there is also like a couple stories from India which reincarnation is a big belief over there where like there's children that they praised because they had full memories and people who were old enough to know the person they re quote unquote reincarnated was able to actually verify that yeah that that actually happened this was that person and then it would be like by the time they were 10 they were just like oh what are you talking about <laughs> wow mm-hmm I don't know. Some of them, some of them are some crazy. Maybe stories. Maybe that's why I don't remember <laughs> the dreams that I had. It's weird because the dreams that I do remember having as a kid, one was my grandmother died when I was one and a half, mm-hmm. and I didn't even go to her funeral. But I used to have this nightmare. Maybe because I kind of obsessed over not knowing her because everybody else had grandparents. Right. And she was my only grandmother that was alive after I was born. Um, I don't have any memories of her, but I have pictures of me with her. But anyway, I used to have a nightmare that I was at her funeral and my mom did tell me that her favorite color was pink. So everything at the funeral was pink. Oh, yeah. And like, we were like, just, you know, having a funeral. Mm, yeah. Just, you know, <laughs> yeah. And all of a sudden people dressed up as ninjas showed up and like shot up the place. And I used to have that nightmare a lot. It's weird. Dream interpreters, let me know. Right. <laughs> and then I always used to have the dream of running in slow motion away from things that I was really afraid of at the time. No, oh, Lord. Yeah, like when I was little, I used to be afraid of Nosferatu. Because yeah. I came down to, snuck down in the basement while my dad was watching TV and he was watching that. Mm-hmm. And um, it scared the shit out of me. Well, I had you a nightmare that. about running away from him. Rude. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get for sneaking out. Yeah. So, uh, do you want to tell them where they can find us now? Oh, yeah. So, we have Insta, TikTok, Twitter, and Facebook. And they're all under the name This and That with Me and You. All right, cool. cool yeah. Cool. And if you have any suggestions, we have an email that you can send to. You. Yeah, if you want to reach out to us with, you know, personal experiences, personal stories, dealing with Anything of the above. Cause we're or even about. just like infamous stories that you want us to talk about or like stories in your hometown. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that email is tatwmay1 at gmail.com. That is T-A-T-W-M-A-Y-1 at gmail.com. As in this and that with me and you. Right. One at gmail.com. But just the letters, the first one. And just a heads up, guys, we are considering Patreon at this point, but, you know, we're not that popular yet, so we're not sure. Yeah, and we're talking about YouTube maybe, but we don't really want to do video because ugh, I don't want to be representable. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, we're, you know, we're building and growing, so uh, if you got any, you know, suggestions along the way, just reach out. Yeah, again, that email is t-a-t-w-m-a-y-1 at gmail.com all right thanks guys fuck babe we forgot to do the word of the day all right monday may 29th 2023 the ross and panadas that can't be right something and panadas what right (laughs) that is not what that says (laughs) oh my lord okay it's lares and pinatas. <laughs> it's household goods. Gods. Ooh, sorry. Household, household gods. gods. Perfect. Personal or household effects. Moving out of her apartment allowed Monique to take an inventory of all her lares and pinatas. I've never heard that said before. <laughs> she, she had an accumulated... Uh, during her time living there. 
Now, do you want to read the fun fact on the back so that uh, the did you know part, since it's... Did you know the phrase La Raz and Pinatas is at home in the elevated writings of scholars? A classicist could tell you that La Raz and Pinatas were Roman gods once worshipped as guardians of the household. And an avid Walpolean... Okay. Might tell you that their favorite author, Horace Walpole, is credited with their first domesticating phrase, with first domesticating the phrase to refer to a person's possessions. In the century since Walpole used La Ras and Panatas in an 1775 letter to the English poet William Mason, the phrase has become solidly established in the English language. It is solidly, yeah, solidly mm -hmm. established we in the English. English language that I can't speak. Now, I want to point out to any... Ross and Panadas. I want to point out to any of our future listeners that um, we're American uh, from the United States. Um, can't speak a bit of any other language america fuck yeah <laughs> we don't give a bit we I don't did, care did, 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 about did, did, did. other people's languages that's not true though we do care yeah all respect we just we're just terrible at pronouncing things and we're i'm i have adhd and i i could not learn a second language i failed spanish twice and i, I dropped mean, out before i finished sign language so i got i'm not even fluent in that I mean, we kind of just proved that because it was definitely Spanish names. Um, but don't email us. Don't come after us about the pronunciation of those two because I'm pretty sure I'm going to Google that here in a few minutes and be like, oh, I totally fucked that up. Oh, yeah. Insert pronunciation later in here. Right. <laughs> Larry's and Pennants. Yeah, we were way off. <laughs> All right, well, that's uh, this and the that. The word of the day. Well, yeah. This and that with me and you. Bye, guys.